Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This is episode 85, The Murder of Caroline Dickinson. On a summer night, 1996, Caroline Dickinson, 13, is found dead in the news hostel in Brittany. Nobody heard or saw anything. How is that possible? No, it's never good when you have a young victim, I have to say. Caroline was 13 and on a school trip to France from the UK. She had never left the UK before. She had saved £90 in pocket money over time to finance part of the trip and she asked her dad to pay for the rest, which was about £70. Things were cheap at the time. She was studying French at school and really wanted to go on that trip. Oh, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's left me with a very sad heart. I, I um, I did the same kind of thing when I was. Um, I probably would have been a little bit older. Don't I? I think I was sixteen when well, the first time I came to France. We went to from Aberdeen all the way to Chamonix in a bus. Good lord, I certainly would not consider doing that now. Her school in Cornwall had been organising summer trips to France for kids for many years. They left Cornwall on the 14th of July 1996 with about 35 kids, direction Pooh first for the ferry, mm-hmm. to Samaru. Right, okay, so it's not, not so long on the motorway. No, no. Well, Cornwall, yeah, to Pooh is not very far and then it's no. mostly overnight uh, mm. Ferry, so it's not. Yeah, I mean, if they were doing bad. it all the way to Dover. Ugh. Yeah, that, well, that's what I did when I went to to Bath from uh, from Paris. Mm. We took the ferry at Calais and then drove all the way down southern England all the way to Bath. Mm. Yeah, but Cornwall mm. is still that bit further down because you have to go through Devon and then but Cornwall. They only went to Saint Malo. I went from Paris, which is like four hundred kilometers away yeah, already. That's true. So it's a long trip, but mm. it's fine. The bus stopped in Saint Malo in the evening to watch the fireworks on the 14th of July. Yeah, right, okay. Then started again towards Plain Fougere, where the school had booked a youth hostel. In the morning of the 18th of July, 1996, Caroline is found dead in her room, number four, that was on the first floor of a youth hostel. During the trip, Caroline had became, become friends with four other girls, and she had asked to share their room. It was three kids per, uh, four kids per room. But because she was the fifth one, she was sleeping on the mattress on the floor. All right. Okay. So there was four, another four people in this room when it was five people in that room, including Caroline. Yes. Oh, that's weird. To avoid problems with kids locking themselves in their rooms, you can tell they've done it before. Mm. The teachers collect all the door keys. So nobody can lock her a door. During the 15th and 16th of July, the kids visit the local touristy sites. They go to Mont Saint-Michel, Bayeux, Saint-Malo and all those places. Mm -hmm. On the 17th of of July, the group visits a nearby fortified town. And in the afternoon, the teachers take the kids to the beach. A dozen of the kids also decide to stay at the youth hostel because they're not interested in the beach. Mm-hmm. They're 13, they're starting to be difficult. Yeah, of course. Caroline is one of them. So these kids spend the afternoon walking around town, then go back to their room to read magazines. The small group of girls met two French boys on holiday for the summer with their parents in the town. They nicknamed them Kurt and Tony. <laughs> I have no idea what their real names are. These are not their real names, no. but that's what they call them. Oh, I see. Of course, the kids probably wouldn't speak much English, so who knows. Many of the kids are busy organizing a party for that evening because it's their last day in France. They'll return in the UK the next morning. But Caroline and Jenny, one of the four other girls, decide to play with the boys instead in the courtyard of the hostel. At about 11 p.m., all the kids go to their rooms to sleep. Mm Mm-hmm. Caroline and her four roommates chat for a while and sing songs. Of course they do, the way, the way 13-year-old girls do. Yeah. Eventually, one of the teachers has to come and ask them to go to sleep 
mm. after kids in neighboring rooms complained about the noise. <laughs> right. So the four, five girls continued chatting quietly until about 1 a.m. It's summer and hot in for Brittany, I guess. I was waiting to say, it's not really it's that warmish, hot in Brittany. Would, <laughs> yeah, it's the frozen north. And the windows are obviously kept open mm -hmm. because it must be 20 degrees. Ooh. Ooh, roasting. The front door is also unlocked, despite the fact that the director of the hostel promised that the front and back doors would be locked from about 11 in entirety. Oh, yeah, they always make a big deal of these things. In there. Yeah. But, well, from what I can remember, it's been decades since I've stayed in a hostel. Yeah, but for some reason they were locked, left unlocked. Yeah, Nobody that's, knows why. that's very dodgy. At around 8am 8, 8 on the 18th of July, one of the teachers knocks on the door of room number four to tell the girls that it was time to get up and go for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Four of the girls get up, but Caroline doesn't move. The four girls try to wake her up. One of them notices that Caroline's lips are blue. So they try to like push her up with their foot. <laughs> nice. But nothing happens. So eventually one of them takes her pulse mm. at her wrists. And doesn't find any. And it is cold and there's no pulse. Oh so then they God. panicked. Those poor girls, that's not the kind of thing you want to Oh, think they're never travelling again. No, no. No, they're never leaving home. Two teachers arrive. One of them moves Caroline to the safety position, thinking that she had some kind of sickness. Mm. She notices a red stain near her hips. And the group nurse also arrives because they were traveling with five or eight adults. Eight, eight adults, I think. One mm -hmm. of them a nurse, I think. She lifts Caroline's eyelids and she knows she's dead. I think really the blue lips and the fact she's stone cold might kind of yeah, give it away. Probably, yes. But then again, I forget everyone's not a horrible ghoul like I am and knows way too much about dead bodies. Yeah. At 8.30, the village doctor, doctor arrives as well mm. and says that Caroline was raped and killed. Oh, God, she's been sexually assaulted as well. According to the doctor, yes. Oh, God. Shortly after, the gendarmes also arrive and they cordon off the room. They also assemble everyone downstairs in the restaurant room. To avoid panicking the kids, the teachers tell them that Caroline isn't feeling well and is going to the hospital. So nobody knows at that point that she's dead. Right, no, I mean, well, I guess None of the non four girls, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, you don't want a room full of, for a bus a load of hysterical panic, kids. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's not good. In the meantime, the gendarmes are told that two people are missing, a biker and his partner, who left early that morning. The ME arrives... And confirms the finding of the local doctor. Mm -hmm. Sperm is found on her body. And the rigidity of the body tells the Amy that Caroline died less than 12 hours earlier. All the men accompanying, accompanying the group, which is the teachers and the Italian bus driver, have their DNA collected mm -hmm. to compare to the sperm. Only five boys of the groups aren't asked to provide blood sample. It was 35 kids, but only five boys. boys. It was 30 right. girls. Of course, we're in the mid-90s now, so at least we've got you yes. know, DNA. Yeah. The kids are then taken to the Mary and questioned. Mm -hmm. The girls sharing the room with Caroline do mention that they heard a few noises in their half-sleep, but they didn't pay attention. According to them, Jenny, one of the four girls, was often talking in her sleep, so they assumed it was just her talking in her sleep and they just went back to sleep. One of the girls, Laura Daphne, or Daphne, says that it might not be related, but she noticed a strange man on the 16th in the hotel, a hostel's, a hostel's courtyard. Mm -hmm. She had stayed behind when the others had gone to do some tourism because she had a migraine. And she describes him as appearing to be casing the, jaint, the joint, staring at windows, but looking nervous. He had a heavy walk, a bent back, and menacing eyes. He's just a monster. <laughs> <laughs> she saw him again the next day when she went to play tennis. Yeah, all that's missing is the, the moustache for him to be twirling, yeah. isn't it, really? Yes. Another girl, Amy White, tells the gendarmes that at about 1.30 a.m. she had wanted to go to the bathroom with two other girls. But as soon as she opened her door, she heard footsteps in the corridor and she had seen a man in front of room 5, not room 4. 
the three girls decide to wait a little while before coming out of their rooms, which they eventually do at about 1.45 a.m. And as they go downstairs, they meet a man. Amy had a good look at him and creates a photo fit with the gendarmes. Laura confirms that this is the man that she saw in the courtyard. All right, so there is definitely somebody creepy hanging about then. There is definitely something going, yes. There's somebody around that's been seen for a few days. And and what is it about women that they can't go to the toilet on their own? Oh, it's, I yes. mean, there must be something in women's DNA that yes. they're just unable to go to the loo on their own. But just yes. as well, more eyes on this creep, yes. the better. One of the teachers, Jackie Thorpe, who slept in room number two, says that she heard some noise in front of the hostel at about 4am. Thinking that one of the kids was trying to sneak out, she went downstairs and waited by the door, mm. but nobody showed up, so she went back to bed after about 10 minutes. At around 5am, still awake, she heard noises again. She got up and looked at the window, and she saw a man wearing jeans and a jacket outside. Then shortly later, the noise of a car starting, making a noise like cooking pans. Uh, there must be rattling things on the car, I have no idea. But right. that's what she described it as. That's, it was actually quoted from her. Yeah. It's kind of weird you'd be wearing a jacket in France in, uh, in, July. in July. Yeah. Phew. Even in, even in freezing Brittany, I mean, yeah. that still feels weird. Yes. It doesn't, long, it doesn't take long for the rumour of a murder to go around town. Mm. At that point, the cat is out of the bag, so the gendarmes go around the neighborhood and start asking questions to the neighbors. Mm. It doesn't take long either for journalists to also arrive in town. At about 7.30 p.m., Caroline's body is taken to the Medical Legal Institute in Rennes for the autopsy. The instructing judge and the UK consul from Samalo also arrive. The doctor confirms the previous findings from the other two, Caroline was strangled, with marks on her neck. Her nose and mouth were obstructed. Mm. Yeah, that's why the girls didn't hear. Yes, and that's what killed her in about in under two minutes, he said. Her stomach contents show that the food had been completely digested, putting her time of murder at about 3.30 a.m. Right. She had also been raped. Ugh. Another thing the autopsy showed is that Caroline's bladder was totally empty. It takes about 15 to 45 minutes for the, the urinary system to restart filling the bladder after you had a pee. Mm. So most likely she had been to the toilet shortly before she was killed. Oh God, I which wonder Which nobody if, mentioned. I wonder if that's what got her killed. Her being out mm. of her room. Possibly. Caroline is buried on the 25th of July. And on that day, her parents received a postcard from her sent from France. Oh my God. Oh, that's so sad. Those poor people. 50 gendarmes are put on the case, full-time. Mm. But at that point, the only evidence is a small piece of cloth or cotton that was used to suffocate her mm. and some sperm found on, the, found on the body. The affair turns international when two couples who were stay, staying at the hotel, hostel on the night of the murder are questioned in Switzerland and their blood taken. Wow. Another man in Italy is also questioned and his blood taken. And finally, a French guy from Amiens, who was in the area at the time, is interviewed and he says to the gendarme that somebody had opened his door in the middle of the night um, from the room he was sharing with his girlfriend. And when he asked who was there, nobody answered, so he got up and locked the door. Why are these people not locking their bloody doors? That's just weird. Yeah, in a hotel or something. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's just very strange. Especially, yeah. I mean, no disrespect, but I mean, when you're staying in a hostel, I mean, you do have like groups of kids staying there, but sometimes you do have incredibly sketchy people staying there. And youth hostels, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't mean to disparage people who you know, you you just don't know people's stories, but it, it's easy to, you know come under the guise of being a bit down and out and you're just a giant creep. Yes. The neighbourhood canvassing brings a possible suspect that people saw walking aimlessly around town before the murder. Mm -hmm. The name of that guy is Patrice Paddy. 
He was born in 1957. He was half a vagrant. And he was known by the authorities for various cases of, uh, I guess, indecent exposure. Oh, my God. The, 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 the very much the crime of the uh, 70s and 80s. Yeah. But that's 1996. At that yeah, point, he's, he's late. Come on, get, get with the times, dude. Yeah. On the 18th and 19th of July, as he's given room by a priest in Pont Orson, he hears on the radio of Caroline's murder. On Saturday, the 20th, mm-hmm. he decides to go home in Oise, north of Paris. On his way, as he hitchhikes, because again, he's got no he, money. Thinks in the 70, he lives in the 70s, yeah. he's spotted by a gendarme who was installing a mobile spin camera. He's arrested because you're not allowed to hitchhike on the motorway. No, they generally do it on the the runoff. Yes. If you're leaving right. for petrol and stuff. Yeah, before the PIG, you're allowed to be, yeah. but not after that. So. Yeah. so he's arrested and taken to Saint-Malo. There he's questioned, and his completely confused answers and his past make him the ideal suspect. Mm. Witnesses recognize him, because he's been reported he was walking around town the previous right. days. So he's kept in, jail, kept in jail for 48 hours. Okay. Do, does he look like the photo of it? Did they mention that? I didn't see a photo of him. I don't know. Right. Um, I don't know if he... If if saying he photo fits are really pointless, but yeah. I, I don't know if he looks like it. To try to make him talk, the gendarmes refused to give him his medication and starve him of alcohol because he was an alky. Right. That seems a bit barbaric withholding uh, yes. medication. That I, I don't entirely approve of that. Yes. After 43 hours, he confesses to the rape and murder of Caroline. Yeah, but anybody would... Uh... Yes. Uh, God. So okay. he's taken to the judge and he confirms his confession. Case closed. I'm he's, thinking not. He's sent to prison awaiting trial. In prison, he receives death threats from other inmates. Mm. And it never goes... It really, and even, even with murderers, it never ever goes down well that you... Fuck kids. No. And let's put it in black and white, and that's what it is. Also, some gendarmes have doubts on his confession. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said things that don't match reality. Uh, for example, he says that uh, Caroline was a nice blonde when it was dark and the uh, lights were off. So, mm. how does he know he's, she's a blonde? Also, he said that two girls were sleeping in the same bed when they were single beds, and all the girls deny that they ever did that. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, police are lazy. We've we've already established that. Yes, yes. So they would prefer if DNA confirmed that he was guilty. Yes. Instead of just sending him to jail because he said he was. But that doesn't stop the judge from organizing a press conference and announce that the murderer has been arrested. On the 26th of July, Paddy writes to the judge to inform him that he's recanting his confession and that he's not Caroline's murderer. Finally, on the 30th of July, DNA tests on Paddy, done in Bordeaux, show that he's not the guy. However, the judge, not wanting to lose his murderer, keeps the test results secret, secret and requests a new test. He thinks that two men were involved. Paddy might have been one of them, but someone else might have done the raping. He thinks that two grown men who were in that room when there was four other sleeping people there. Who never heard or saw anything. Yeah. Yes, that's what he's saying. No, the judge just wants to uh, close the case. Yes. Another case of lazy judge. Yes. So he requests a new test and his lawyer demands that he's freed because they have nothing on him. Yeah. But that's denied by the judge. On the 6th of August... The second test confirms the first one. Mm. That's not the guy. No. So the judge has no choice but to let him go. He goes himself to the prison, the, the, the judge, to free him in front of journalists. Paddy requests spending the night in the gendarmerie barracks because he has nowhere to go. But the judge still keeps Paddy under surveillance because he's still convinced there are two men involved. So he wants to see if he's going to meet the other guy at some point. So, so they keep he, an so, eye on him. And so if he talks to any other men yeah, for the much. rest of his life, then it was yes. him. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> in 1998, two years later, Paddy is awarded 10,000 euros or so for 17 nights in, nights in prison. Unjustified. Uh, and, uh, so, and that's him gone from the case? Yeah. Good. I hope he sorts his life out. Come on, Paddy, pull yourself together. 
don't know, uh, didn't look up. Um, so it, it, that's the authorities back to square one. And you can imagine the tabloids' reaction in the UK. Mm. Uh, apparently they were savage. No, but I find that very hard to believe. I yeah. think the British tabloid uh, press are a fantastic yeah. bunch of people. Not complete scumbags at all. Yes. So back in the UK, as one of the mothers, the, one of the kids' mothers tells a British newspaper that her daughter's declarations have been ignored by the French authorities, the judge delivers an international warrant on the 15th of August to send French gendarmes to interview kids and people in the UK. Right. Caroline's father, helped by his local MP, demands that all men in Plain Fougere be tested to find the murderer. According that would be a lot of money, Oh, surely. that would be thousands of people. According to him, if it's not Paddy, it has to be a local. But the judge refuses because it, he says that it wouldn't move the case forward and also it would cost a fortune. And also, dude, you know, it's... It's July in Brittany. Oh, yeah, you would have to trace back all the tourists. Exactly. And everything. It would be an insane be amount of so work. There'd be so many people who don't have anything to do with the town that were yeah. there. And that are not recorded anywhere. And yeah. It would be very, very difficult. I to mean, do. You, you do want to move heaven and earth to find out what happens to your kid. You can understand. But it, yeah. I, I think it's just not logistically possible to, yes. to track down everybody. Also, at the time, a DNA test would cost 300 yes. to 600 euros. Yeah, and also you'd be waiting, you know, a long time for the um, results. No, no, it was quite fast. Quite was fast. The, the paddy tests only took a few days. All ah, right, okay. But well, still, uh, at 600 euros oh, a yeah, test, if you test, let's say, 10,000 people, mm. uh, that's millions. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that is a lot of money. And all for no reason as well. Yes. The instructing judge is ordered to proceed with the testing by another judge. But he refuses, uh, which automatically takes him off the case. <laughs> right, okay. He's gone. Because he refused to do what uh, uh, his superior judge has ordered him, yeah, and okay. he's just kicked out. That's it. Reminds me of Jouge uh, uh, Roba from Angry Yes, Hash. it's exactly that. <laughs> when he has to talk to the other judge. Yes. yes. Remember the, the guy, short guy with the big head? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ex it's exactly that. Yeah. So he refused to do what he was ordered, and therefore he's taken out of the case. Mm -hmm. So they start test testing. They do 260 DNA tests on local men, all possible suspects, mm -hmm. and all ruled out. The new judge collects information about similar cases all over the country to see if they could be linked, so if it's a serial killer that they have on their hands. And it turns out that there are several similar stories that took place in that summer of 1996 in Brittany, in places called Saint-Lunaire, Saint-Brieuc, and Saint-Malo. A lot of saints kicking about up there. Yeah, so that's four cases that potentially are linked. Right. He also runs DNA tests on a local biker group, because Paddy was a biker, but nothing comes of it. They're still desperate to pin it on poor old oh, Paddy. Oh, he's not forgotten. He's still in, uh, in very much in the middle yeah. of the investigation, but they have nothing on him. To help the, ca help the case, public DNA labs... Like owned by the government, mm -hmm. volunteer to run the tests for free. Oh, right, okay. Instead of going through an expensive lab. The lab in Bordeaux was private, so that's why it was expensive. Right. So the judge then tests a few hundred more men in local area. Presumably they would uh, target people who have kind of like sexual offence. Yeah, well, stuff. yes, or uh, we're very close or yes. something like that. They can't test lived thousands in, of people yeah, randomly. Yeah, lived it's in the same possible. street. And, yeah, uh, something like that, yes. They all rule out except one. One refused to take part. Okay, that doesn't look... So the judge orders his house to be searched. Right. And they do a DNA test on one of his toothbrush. Right. And he's also ruled out. He just didn't want his DNA collected. Yeah, I mean, you can understand why. Oh, yeah, because he's in the file forever and yeah. then that's it. Mm. But that's it does make you look terribly... Well, that's what... Yeah, exactly. Suspicious. Yeah. Then the judge orders the DNA to be checked against the DNA, the DNA database in the UK. Still no joy. Then he has 3,500 people, all thieves and rapists in France, checked, all negative again. Wow. So now we're in the thousands. Oh, tell you what, you can't accuse them of sitting back and not doing anything. Yes. So then the judge has an idea. He has the cotton of the, the thing used to suffocate ah, Caroline yes, tested. Mm-hmm. The lab confirms that it's hydrophilic cotton, 
and some of its components are only found in the UK cotton. Ooh. So he therefore gets a new photo fit made following some of the girls' declarations. Okay. And now he's thinking, hmm, is the UK involved in that story? Yes, quick, get it on crime watch. Yes. The judge also links to a case of attempted murder a few hours before Caroline's um, actual murder in a nearby youth hostel about 50 kilometers away. The authorities then become certain that that murder, that the murderer is someone who, who's attracted by young girls, sleeps in youth hostels, and acts at night, all fairly obvious. Mm-hmm. In January 1998, a year and a half after the murder, the judge finds the testimony of one of the teachers of the group, Nicholas Ward, who was a science teacher, and he said to the director of his school, not to the authorities, to the director of his school, that he had seen a man that night at about quarter past midnight. It was in the corridor of the second floor. His description roughly matches the description of one of the girls. Right. So the cops go to the UK, make a photo fit with him, and then they have two photo fits. Right. They then go to Manchester to show it to the girl that was attacked in the other youth hostel, Mm -hmm. and she instantly recognizes him. Oh, right. Okay, so we're on to a winner then. So now they know they have a serial murderer, or attempted murderer at least. Then they start putting together what happened on that night. The man would have been to the youth hostel in Plaine Fougère on the 15th of July to check the place. He was spotted there. Mm -hmm. Then on the 17th in the evening, he would have got to the hostel... At about quarter past midnight, he would have been spotted by Nicholas Ward on the second floor. Mm-hmm. Then the three girls went to the bathroom. Seeing all these people awake, he decided to leave and go to another youth hostel. And that's why he attacked the other girl. And that's why it was so late at night. Yes. But there, he's found out. So as he's attacking the girl, um, two other girls who were in the same room wake up and they saw a man on top of their friend. Jesus. They scream and he runs away. This man has really deeply disturbed a lot of people. Oh, yeah. So at that point, he decides to go back to Flint Fougere, the first place, Mm. because he's hoping that everybody's going to be asleep. So that's about 4 a.m. at that point. And sadly, they were. Yes. That's the guy who was heard walking outside on the gravel by Jackie Thorpe. Oh, yeah, the teacher on the ground floor. Exactly. Well, on the first floor, but she went downstairs. But yeah, she had a window and Mm -hmm. she, she saw outside. And the thing that he met Caroline coming back from the toilets. Yeah. On the 11th of February 1998, Nicholas Ward's photo fit is put in all gendarmerie barracks in the country. And on the 13th of February, two days later, it's sent to the press and TV. Going back to the similar cases in Brittany in 96, the authorities consult Scotland Yard and they talk to one of their profilers, like the BAU. Yeah, mm-hmm and to a friend psychologist to try to get a description of his personality. Mm-hmm. And from that, they make a list of 223 known criminals that match the description. And after investigation, because they can rule out a few of them who had good alibi, mm. they have 95 names left. Okay. One of the names on that list intrigues the investigating, ju- investigating judge because of another affair in 1994. Right, oh dear. A group of Irish girls from Limerick are housed in the castle at La Grande Touraine, so a bit more further than land. Mm-hmm. One of the girls wakes up with a man sitting on the bed, on her bed. Oh my God. Who asks her if she wants to come and help him repair his car. <laughs> Is that really a good, a good reason to be on some girl's name in the middle of the night? Come and repair my car. Oh my God. My blood has just run so <laughs> cold. That is the f- most frightening thing I've ever heard. Now you're going to lock the doors of the house. Oh God. She asks him who he is several times, but she never answers. Oh, I wouldn't be asking him anything. I'd be screaming in his face. Well, she, she switches the lights on and he gets up and leaves. Oh. <laughs> the next day, during a picnic... She spots the man again. He walks past her and smiles at her. The director of the youth hostel 
is alerted by the girl mm. and they press these charges at the local gendarmerie. When they look into what happened, they discover two other similar incidents the previous year in the same location. So there's now a whole bunch of cases that are very, very similar in several places. So this girl was Irish? Yes. So when the guy was talking to her, did she not pick up on... That's something I... Well, I wondered if he talked to her in English or in French. Yeah. I don't know. None of the newspaper uh, accounts I read were specific about that. I don't know. Because if I woke up in the middle of the night and I was half awake, Mm -hmm. I would automatically be in English. I wouldn't be in French mode. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. So the gendarme decided to keep an eye on the place mm. at the time, the castle. And during the night of the 19th of July, 1994, at about 2.30 a.m., they arrest a man who seemed to try to get into the hostel. All right. When interrogated, he denies having done anything wrong. He lives in London. He works as a waiter. But he was looking for a place to sleep. On him, they find a card to allow him to stay in any youth hostel in the world, essentially. I remember those passes when I was a kid. Mm. They also search his car, which is strangely registered in, in, in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands? Yeah. That's weird. But they don't find anything of interest. After eight hours, having nothing to pin on the man, they let him go. But they write his name down, Francisco Arce Montes. That's a... Uh... Spanish name. That's what you say. It sounds very Spanish. Yes. The judge asked the London police to go to his address. So we're now back in 1998. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back to from the 94 yes. to... Yes, so that's the case from 1994. Yes. So the judge in 1998 uh, contacts the, the London police and mm-hmm. asks them to go to the address that he gave to the gendarmes when he was arrested in 1994. But he's long gone, obviously, oh, four, said, four years later. Yeah, so. I mean, he's a, he's a waiter in London. There's no way he's going to be at the same address. Yes. By 1998, the gendarmes had received 2,400 phone calls, ruled out 1,500 people. They still investigate reports from all over France and neighboring countries, right. including cases in Nancy in 1993, where they're sure at 95% that it was already the same guy. So we're not talking... Things happening with that guy from 93 to 96, right. at least. Yeah. We really need to track him down and get his DNA. Yeah. In January 1999, the gendarmes contacts Montes' mother. Mm-hmm. But she tells them that she hasn't had any contact with her son since December 97. Right. So the gendarmes send Montes' name to the authorities in France and the UK on the 26th of January so that everybody looks for him. And they send, they send the same request to all Schengen countries in, on the 19th of February. So it's like a mass So most bolo. of Europe is now looking for him. So he's a mass bolo then? Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, nothing happens for a while despite, despite sightings in places that are investigated, but he's never there. Um, they also have people who recognize the guy, uh, for example, from building sites where he worked. Right. But from years and years earlier, so that's not helpful. So he's he's clearly a bit of a drifter. And he's moved around. He's not a drifter, he has jobs. Yeah, but no, well, that's but what I mean, is casual jobs or not. Yeah, he, he moves he's around a lot. He's got a career and, yeah. you know. And he moves around countries. Yes. Which makes it hard to try to trace. Yeah. I mean, Schengen's good, but not for when you're tracking down murderers. Yes. Towards the end of March 2001, a French journalist working for the Sunday Times in France contacts the judge for an interview about the affair. Wants to know what's going on. Yeah. She asks him if there are any names of interest. And the judge says, yep, they have 48 names left. One of them stands out. It's Montes. Mm -hmm. The interview is published on the 1st of April, 2001. On the 3rd of April, two days later, an ICE agent in the US randomly picks up a newspaper left by a passenger coming from the UK on on the counter. Okay. It's a Sunday time. He's at the time working on a case of weapon smuggling between the UK, the US and Canada. The picture on the front page of the newspaper has someone holding weapons. That's what attracted him to the newspaper. Mm-hmm. So he was intrigued and decided to read the, the newspaper later that day. All right. At home, he reads the newspaper and he reads the article about Caroline's murder. And he remembers having heard about the case because he had a son at the time who was about the same age. Mm, yeah, you instantly think of your own kids, don't yes, you? Yes, exactly. 
So he enters the name of the main suspect, Montes, in his computer to see if he had been in the US. Mm. And ding, 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 ding. Ooh. They show that Francisco Arce Montes is detained in Florida. He's detained. He's detained in Florida. Oh, that means it'll be very easy to find then. Yes. So he contacts Interpol and the UK authorities. On the 4th of April 2001, the new judge on the case happens to be in the UK for a ceremony in relation with the case. Right. And he also was going to listen to a presentation of the coroner in Bodmin. And a French gendarme who speaks English, uh, wi- wi- uh, who was with him, mm-hmm. placed translator between the ICE agent and the judge. Right. So again, that's two very, very unlikely things happening it at is. the same time. On the 8th of April, the ICE agent checks the records again to mm-hmm. see what Montes is doing. And he's still held in Florida for indecent assault. He gave a fake name to the authorities. Mm-hmm. And he was arrested entering a motel room via the window where a one woman was sleeping and masturbating on top of her. Oh, God. His DNA had been collected. So the French judge sends his DNA records from France to Florida to compare. Right, so we've got two semen samples now. Yes. To compare. And at that point, at the same time, the gendarmerie um, makes his way to the US, so his wheels up. On the 14th of April... The AG, the general um, attorney, I attorney guess. Attorney general. Attorney general in the yeah. US. Uh, there's something equivalent in France, in Rennes. Calls a press conference and announces the DNA tests show that Montes is the murderer with 99.9 certainty. Mm-hmm. On the 19th of April, the judge publishes an international warrant for Montes with immediate arrest to prevent him from fleeing again. On the 8th of June... A tribunal in Florida examines this with extradition request from France, Mm -hmm. from Montes. And on the 19th of June, the judge, the US judge, allows the extradition. But Montes' lawyer appeals, which cancels the the extradition agreement. At the time, the trial in France was set for the 2nd of July, but that's not going to happen because he's still going to be in the US. Mm, Yeah. Because in the US, his trial for the extradition is set to the 29th of October. Oh, right, of course, that's a big distance. That's a while, yeah. yeah. The, his lawyer tries everything he can to delay the extradition. As Montes pleads not guilty to the Florida charges, and they always do. Oh, well, yeah, everyone's always innocent, aren't they? His trial for that is delayed until the 3rd of June 2002. Wow. So for pretty much another year. Yeah. But on the 19th of November... After negotiations between the U.S. and France, the U.S. judge accepts to drop the charges or some of the charges against Montes and frees him on bail, right. which he pays straight away. Yay, he's free! Yeah. But as he's leaving the tribunal, he meets two FBI agents who are waiting for him and arrest him under the international warrant. Oh, because now he's free, so he can be arrested. Is that, that's the, uh, the ultimate... Uh Sting in the tail in, in many a, a TV cop detective. Oh, no, we're not going to arrest you. It's going to be the CIA or, or the FBI. So that actually does happen then. Yeah, well, in this case, they couldn't arrest him under the international warrant because he was in jail for something else. Mm-hmm. And you can't do lots of things at the yeah, same time, you, so you have to wait. Yes, our, tr- our murder trumps your sexual assault kind of thing. That doesn't work. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. But because he was freed by the judge, yes. then he could be arrested again. Yes. And then they can extradite him regardless, presumably. Yeah, but at that point, there was no, no reason waiting. Yeah. So they put him on the plane straight away for Good. Paris. Good show. And he arrives in France at 9.30 a.m. the next morning. Mm-hmm. He's immediately arrested as he comes out of the plane and sent to jail. Mid-November, during questioning, he admits that he was in Plain Fougere on the 17th and 18th of July 1996. Mm -hmm. He even confesses at some point that on that day he slipped up and didn't intend to kill Caroline. He just wanted to prevent her from screaming. So he essentially confesses to her murder without knowing it. Oh, sorry, he just wanted to rape her, he didn't want to murder her. Ah, well, that's all right then. So at that point, that's it, they're ready for trial, which starts on the 7th of June 2004, and that's six days. Mm-hmm. The jury is kind of weird. It's composed of six women, three men, and three judges. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, weird. I've, I've never seen that before. I don't know how that, how that works. Mm. Psychologists describe Montes as perverse, having personality problems, egocentric and immature, manipulative and lying. Mm -hmm. But of course, he's responsible and therefore can be tried. During the first few days, Montes says, in Spanish, because he refuses to speak French, even though he's fluent in, in French, mm -hmm. that he doesn't remember and he has nothing to do, or nothing to say. That's pretty much all he answers to every question that he's asked. All right. On the 10th of July, as Caroline's mum is being interviewed, Montes faints in the tribunal. Just for no reason. The trial is suspended for a few minutes, and when he comes back, he says that he's sorry for, he's sorry for what he's done, that he's also so sorry for crying, that he's not the victim, and he knows that Caroline's family will never forgive him, so he confesses again. Right. A garage so, owner, so Caroline's mother's testimony obviously came good then. Yes, yes. A garage owner in Gijon uh, testifies that Montes had shown him a photo of a girl saying that it was Caroline and that she was cute and like a porcelain doll. <laughs> Montes also told him about his taste in very young girls. A ju the jury deliberates for four hours, didn't take long, and they declare him guilty. Mm. He's sentenced on the 14th of June to 30 years in prison with a minimum of 20 years. So um, not eligible for par parole for 20 years. Mm. Of course, against his lawyer's opinion, he appeals on the 21st of June. So the second trial takes place from the 23rd, 21st to 28th of June 2005. So that another seems year. crazy. If you've already said you've done it, I really don't see what they need yeah, for. But you can always appeal the first sentence. Ugh. So unless, un, unlike for the first trial, he speaks in French this time. Okay. Suddenly he knows. Mm -hmm. And instead of being silent he actually answers questions. Mm -hmm. And he says that he never intended to kill Caroline, that he had never seen her before and that he hadn't followed her. So it wasn't premeditated. He's hoping for a lighter sentence of it. Yeah. As witnesses testify, including two of the girls that were in the room because they, none of the girls had testified in the first trial, nobody right. wanted to avoid mm -hmm. it. He becomes more and more silent. His lawyer pleads mental illness. So that, that doesn't stick. No. And after two hours of deliberation, so paperwork time, yep. he, the jury declares him guilty again. Mm -hmm. He's sentenced to 30 years again, mm -hmm. with 20 years minimum again. Mm -hmm. On top of which, the judge adds charges for cases in Germany and in Spain. So he would have been better keeping his mouth shut. So now instead of 30 years with a minimum of 20, he has life in prison. Good. He's in prison on Ile de Ré. So not far from home. Ew, gross, <laughs> he's way too close to us. Get him moved. Uh, and there he also assaulted a guard. So on top of his life in prison, he has now two months oh, <laughs> God. on top of it. Because why not? Yeah. And that's it. He's in prison for the rest of his time. Well, that was an incredibly rough case to go through. I think I might leave you with something nice. If you're looking for some French crime... I think my top tip, and as we lightly touched on it, is you should look for our uh, police series called Engrenage, which is spiral in English. Very good uh, set in a particularly rough area of Paris, but uh, really good watch. And let me leave you something positive. Go watch! <laughs>